Hello, good evening, uh, uh, and welcome to an evening in African American history. Uh, my name is Robert Bubb. I am a lecturer in the Human Development and Family Sciences Department at Auburn University. Uh, and um, I'm honored to be with you this evening uh, and to witness the hard work that our high school students put into learning about and telling uh, the stories that were selected for this particular semester. Um, it was a little over four years ago, I attended an event. Uh, the event was the Ties That Bind. Uh, this event was held at the Caroline Marshall Drawn Center for the Arts and the Humanities. And I was interested in knowing how, or maybe an, even if I could, um, take the history that I had uncovered from my own family research and do something similar for those buried in Auburn's Baptist Hill Cemetery. Um, it would be at this event that I met um, Dr. Terrence Bickerstaff as he told the stories from his family history, uh, those stories of the first documented persons of African descent in Auburn. Uh, and it soon became clear that there was a lot of work um, to do. So uh, we started researching and soon found ourselves presenting to fourth grade students. Um, fourth grade is when students first learn about Alabama history as a class um, here in Alabama. Uh, we were then introduced to Drew Morgan and Caitlin Halperin, um, who were involved involving uh, junior high school students and telling these same types of stories from Baptist Hill. Um, and this semester, we are privileged yet again to be working with Ms. Halperin and her history classes at Auburn High School. Now the presentations tonight are a joint effort from the HGFS 4950 course at Auburn University, the history classes at Auburn High School, and also several members of the community. Uh, those in the community are vitally important to what we do. So we emphasize to the students that the stories we tell do not directly belong to us. Um, we're just fortunate to be able to tell them to tell those stories. And so it's important that we do our best to contact the descendants who are directly related to those stories. Um, you will hear from a couple of those community members tonight. Um, they reviewed and provided feedback on uh, some of the student scripts. You will also hear from a few of the students who participated this semester about what they enjoyed and learned from the projects. Um, it's also important that we do not keep these sacred stories to ourselves. So tonight's program is open to the community and we have made an effort to make the research documents pertaining to those we discuss available through Family Search. Um, family Search is a freely available family history website, um, and we will also have the individual projects available uh, online for, for later view. I can't emphasize enough just how amazing the students were this semester at both the high school and the university levels. Um, although we only had uh, about five classes to meet with the high school students, it was clear that the students took the stories you're about to hear very seriously. Um, it was also clear that their thirst, the thirst by our youth for local African-American history is immense and that we need to find ways to tell the history more often and at more grade levels within our educational system. I obviously look forward uh, to our future semesters and joint efforts to research and tell these amazing stories, um, but I do want to make sure I turn some time over to Ms. Halperin and talk to uh, Dr. Terrence Vickerstaff. Um, following their remarks, we will proceed to the, the, student, um, the student projects. Uh, Ms. Halperin? Yes. Hi, I'm Caitlin Halperin, and I'm a history teacher at Auburn High School. Um, and I just want to say what an honor it is to be able to have researched the stories of the African-American community in Lee County and the amount of um, information that I learned. Um, having been in Auburn now um, eight and nine years, this has been um, just eye-opening to see the uh, history that I've always studied in high school and college and as a master's student. Um, to see how that's played out um, in my local community that I now call home. Um, so thank you for letting us tell your stories and working with the students um, this semester has been wonderful. And two years ago, working with Dr. Bub and Drew Morgan and getting to learn about the history of Baptist Hill Cemetery really piqued my interest. And so when Dr. Bub contacted me in February about upcoming projects for this year, um, I was really excited about that. And then COVID threw a wrench in kind of all our plans, but not really this plan at all. And so the amazing ability of technology to connect us has been such a blessing that we were able to still meet with Dr. Bubb and his students um, all this year and still able to look at historical documents with my students um, from Lee County Courthouse and, and genealogical records throughout the um, semester getting to see them over the screen on Fridays face-to-face -face kind of became a routine that my students really look forward to. 
um, every Friday during the week. Um, and then just to see how they dug into these stories, um, like the stories that they had learned in class about um, the Civil War and Reconstruction and sharecropping, to see that like on a personal level with these stories. And um, I think it was so exciting when we saw um, comments from the families um, when they were reading our scripts that we had written, just to be able to see the students say, wow, someone's actually reading this and this is families that we're talking to, um, just to see their connection um, with local descendants was really, really neat and special. And I think you can see that in the kids' work and um, their descriptions of what they learned and what they liked about the project. So again, we're really grateful to be uh, partnering um, here tonight with our past and we're really looking forward to um, you seeing our stories tonight and the stories that your community has provided. So thanks. Good evening. My name is Dr. Terrence Vickerstaff and I am elated to be in this space. I am a product of the stories of those that are buried in the sacred ground of Baptist Hill. My family uh, came over in 1836, and so we have been woven into the fabric of who Auburn, Alabama, and who Auburn University are. And so on this evening, I ask that you listen with open ears and open hearts to the sacred stories that are buried in the sacred ground so that you can allow yourself to help us continue to curate these narratives that are family-centered, community-centered, church-centered, but most of all, a part of our past that's helping us push ourselves forward. Without these narratives, these people would not remain alive. And it is through this team of, of professors and teachers and students and families, but most of all, those persons that lie in the sacred ground of Baptist Hill that are wanting their stories to be told, that are wanting their stories to be remembered, and that are wanting us to learn from their lives so that we can live better in our contemporary context. I'm a descendant of the Harper family. I'm a descendant of the Vickerstaff family. I'm a descendant of the Bryant family. All of the families that came over, we are elated that some team that we are a part of is doing the work to ensure that our family's narratives remain alive. So welcome, enjoy, and throw those questions at us because we may not have, we may not have an answer today, but you'll help us dig forward. Thank you. students at Auburn High School and have made this story map. A story map is an online platform where you can tie stories with geography using media such as video, pictures, and interactive maps. Our story map is based on Baptist Hill and how it has been affected since its creation as the first black cemetery in Auburn, Alabama. The original conditions of Baptist Hill were quite humble. It has come a long way to be the landmark that it is today. The first and oldest grave on the site is the grave of Regina Andrews, who passed away at the age of 10, dated 1879. Over time, land was donated and provided to Baptist Hill. One notable donation was by Glenn Rudd, who donated 0.4 acres at the north end of the cemetery. Throughout the next century, Baptist Hill experienced harm by constant construction in Auburn. The creation of the East Park subdivision, a white-only subdivision, right next to the cemetery, may have made some visitors from the black community wary of entering. They may have feared that they would be subjected to one of the many crimes committed against people of color at the time. For years, many African-American mourners may not have felt comfortable going near the cemetery due to the racial tensions of the time. With all the construction around it, some might think Baptist Hill is just another cemetery, but in reality, it is a significant source of Auburn's black heritage. The name Baptist Hill was derived from the first black church in Auburn, Ebenezer Baptist Church. Before Ebenezer Baptist Church was constructed, many blacks would have to sneak into services just to go to church or sit in the back or the balcony. Many prominent black individuals were buried in Baptist Hill. Among them are the Clarks, an old and prominent Auburn family for whom Clark Avenue was named. The only Marked graves among them are those of George Clark, a military man, and his wife, Willie, both born around 1890. One source claims that Herbert Clark, possibly the second black man in Auburn to earn a Ph.D., belonged to this family. Another notable grave is that of Pop Foster, the only barber in Auburn near the beginning of the 20th century. Without discrimination, he cut the hair of white people as well as black people, including then-mayor Julius Wright, although his primary customers were college students. Also laid to rest there is Ben J. Jones, a businessman with a shoe...
repair shop on East Magnolia, who served as a deacon in Ebenezer Baptist and was among the first black men in the city to own a car. The oak tree in Baptist Hill has been and still is seen as sacred, but no one knows the exact reason why. Throughout history, oak trees have been seen as sources of wisdom for different cultures. The research gathered includes information about how various cultures would come to an oak tree for advice and guidance in their communities. Also, the oak has stood tall through winds and storms for almost as long as the cemetery has existed, possibly symbolizing strength and longevity. Most cannot put into words the significance of the Baptist Hill oak tree, but rather a comforting feeling. There are not many records about the history of Baptist Hill or other prominent black landmarks in this time due to challenges of racism and segregation. The cemetery gained its name from the first black congregation, whose members were the first black people to be buried there. A century of history lies in Baptist Hill with approximately 400 graves, at least 100 of which remain unidentified. Most laid to rest in the cemetery are those born after slavery. To preserve Baptist Hill is to preserve an important part of the past that is both rich in success and dark in the shadow of slavery and the unrecorded mystery of so much of its history. Baptist Hill Cemetery is significant because it is the only, oldest separate black community cemetery in Auburn. Bordering the cemetery, the East Park subdivision only allowed whites on its property, making it difficult for people of color to visit the cemetery. The integrity of Baptist Hill was also hurt through the widening of Dean Road, placement of mass markers, and damage by citizens. Through this project, we have tried to map the history of Baptist Hill to bring justice and respect to those unrecognized or silenced. It is important to learn about these places and people. We're students at Auburn High School, and we are proposing to build an outdoor classroom on the property adjacent to Baptist Hill Cemetery off of Dean Road. This will be very valuable to the community because it will teach people about a largely untold part of Auburn's history. Baptist Hill Cemetery is the most prominent separate black burial ground in Auburn. There are multiple ideas as to how the land was obtained as a black burial ground, but there is no way to be sure at this time as to who specifically gave the land, as there is no deed of ownership. Newly freed slaves built what was to be the first black church in Auburn, Ebenezer Baptist, which soon gave the name Baptist Hill to this area, and they buried their members here. As more black churches were formed in Auburn, their members began being buried here too. Much of the history of Baptist Hill is shrouded in uncertainties and lack of records as a result of the prejudices and discriminations towards the black community. The Auburn Heritage Association estimates around 100 out of 400 marked graves at Baptist are, un are unidentifiable, not counting the unmarked and unknown graves. 100 people, 100 different stories. Some were enslaved, some were free men, some were born enslaved and survived the Civil War to become free. They were shoemakers, carpenters, and cooks. Some served in wars, some in education, and some were thriving landlords and businessmen. Some are forgotten, but the fight to preserve these stories in our memories lives on. The land right next to Baptist Hill Cemetery at the intersection of South Dean Road and McKinley Avenue is great for an outdoor classroom because of its location and the importance of that location to the town. This outdoor space could bring the lost history of Baptist Hill back to the surface and make the space more relevant. The plot of land is also right by Auburn Public Library and would be a good extension to the library. This opportunity shouldn't be wasted by putting something such as a house on the property. The outdoor classroom can provide education to visitors of the library and cemetery that most people wouldn't get otherwise. Auburn is also home to Auburn University, which brings a lot of people to our town who aren't from here originally. This space can provide a chance for these non-natives to learn a part of Auburn's history that is hidden or not readily available on the internet. It also supplies a space for Auburn University students to gather and learn. In addition to the university, the land is located by Auburn High School, Auburn Junior High, and Dean Road Elementary. These schools can utilize the outdoor classroom space as a teaching tool and for educational field trips. Overall, this land would make a great space for an outdoor classroom to educate members of our community on Baptist Hill and Black history in Auburn. With the outdoor classroom, we really wanted to create a comfortable and dynamic space for the community to enjoy, a place where people can learn and connect with others. There will be a bathroom and water fountain using the plumbing from the business, which will be demolished. For the classroom itself, we chose to use an amphitheater layout using wooden or stone tiers as seating and a wooden podium up front. Considering the space is a classroom, it was necessary to think about how best to engage people, and the amphitheater works best. It engages and pulls the attention. It's also just most practical. Above the amphitheater itself is a massive overhang made from wooden or some other material such as weather tarps. This is to provide protection from the elements in case the weather becomes rainy or the sun is too harsh. The posts supporting the overhang itself play an important role as well. Hung in the post are plexiglass windows in which classroom coordinators can insert QR codes, which link directly to website and resources about Baptist Hill. This space is a collaborative and overall comfortable space for the community to enjoy and learn about Baptist Hill. 
The history behind the Baptist Hill Cemetery is extremely important in the development of the city of Auburn and deserves more recognition. Virginia Purdue, for example, has the oldest marked grave in the cemetery. Her husband, Jalis Purdue, was hired by Booker T. Washington to teach shoemaking to black students at Tuskegee University. Ephraim Drake also contributed to the rich history in Auburn. He was brought to Auburn originally as a slave and was forced into labor on behalf of his enslaver in the Confederate Army during the Civil War. After the war, he worked as a drayman for the Thomas Hotel. Drake resided in a frame house and he died around the 1900s and was buried next to his daughter Maggie, just west of Baptist Hill Cemetery's Ebenezer Baptist Church that was formed by freed slaves. Not only is it the oldest black church in Auburn, it's also one of the oldest in the entire state of Alabama. Historical markers named Lonnie Payne as a landowner, but was deeded to Ebenezer, and, this, and the church was built by soon-to-be members of the church. The congregation left the original building for a new brick sanctuary in 1969. Unfortunately, the original land was probably not given in kindness. The white citizens were likely unhappy with the current system of sharing their churches following the Civil War, even if the black Christians were worshipped in the basement. The land was given in an attempt to further segregate communities in Auburn. This outdoor classroom would give Auburn a dedicated space to tell these important stories that are so often lost. Overall, the space serves such an important purpose of the community. There's a definite lack of awareness in the community for Black history in Auburn, and this outdoor classroom does such a good job at helping engage the community in order to tell that history. Baptist Hill is an important part of Auburn, and the collaborative classroom's relevance to Baptist Hill will be a fixated point of discussion in the classroom. The stories that make up the cemetery will be accessed by way of QR codes that are interchangeable. This brings Baptist Hill into the modern era, helping engage the students who walk through the space itself. The goal of the classroom is to just educate the community on pivotal history of the area, enriching Auburn, and hopefully expanding everyone's worldview. My favorite part of this project was looking at historical documents such as the census records because we got I enjoyed being able to look at first hand pieces of evidence. I work with my friend the and college students to learn more about black history and all that. Be inspired by Gatsy Rice because even though she was facing discrimination at the time, she still worked hard to be a successful businesswoman and that inspires me to be better too. I enjoyed uh, working with my classmates and helping with Dr. Bob. Um, I really enjoyed learning about Baptist Hill Cemetery because there's so much history that is unrecognized and through this project we were really able to try and bring justice and respect to the history that is silenced at Baptist Hill. I really enjoyed getting to know my classmates, they're really cool people and I'm glad I got to work with them and getting to know them was so much fun. I enjoyed working with others to achieve a bigger goal. Well, what I like about the project is like I'm doing something meaningful with the project. Usually when I do projects it's not really it's just Work. But this one has meaning and significance for the black community in Auburn City. I really like working with the university people. Uh, our student Lady Mayfield was really fun to work with and it was a really good working environment. I enjoyed working with my partners and really, really enjoyed working with Mr. Bob. He's a good person and a good I really teacher. like learning about a specific person uh, in general that affects us. I mean, usually you just hear stories of these people who face all these prejudices and you can't really put it in the face. But with this, I'm able to learn about who he was. He was a real person, he had a real family. Not only that was I able to learn about him, but I was able to create a way I could almost honor him and almost help kind of change my community and show others that we are trying to take a step forward. We are trying to make this world a better place where we came close to. What I liked about this project was knowing that I helped contributed to the preservation of local African-American history and keeping their stories uh, alive and in the general context. I enjoyed all the researching aspects because I've always heard stories about like the beginnings of Auburn University, but like all of this stuff I've never heard about. And so getting to like research and finding new things was just a lot of fun and felt almost like a little puzzle that was waiting to be solved. I like getting to talk to my college uh, student and just uh, overall, getting to know my group mates better. Glenn Rudd was an important figure in Auburn's history. However, not well known was a black landowner and descendant of the first settlers of the Auburn area. He completed four years of schooling, was a helper on his father's farm, and likely grew up in a family of sharecroppers. During this time, sharecroppers like the Rudds rented land from, and farm equipment from a landowner. 
they were often required to give at least half of their harvest back to this person. This is a farm he would later come to own and run for the majority of his life with his wife in two daughters. Happily married at 24 to Rhoda Rudd, Glenn and his wife raised two daughters and later possibly two sons. The oldest daughter, Glennie, was born in 1912 and his youngest daughter, Eloise Rudd, was born in 1914. When Eloise was even seen in a local newspaper as part of the first graduating class of the 1932 Lee County Trading School. This was the first trading school for African Americans in Lee County, becoming a symbol of hope for future black education. As a skilled carpenter in the community, he was responsible for some of the building of the trade school and for fashioning the pews for the first African Methodist Episcopal Church. Rudd kept up the family farm as his full-time job. He later sold almost half an acre to the community to add to Baptist Hill Cemetery and to provide a resting place for loved ones, including those who lost their lives fighting in the world wars. This was especially important during the time Baptist Hill Cemetery was the only place someone of color could be buried due to imposed segregation and racial discrimination laws for, forbidding anything otherwise. In November of 1902, Crawford sold the land to Dowdell. The same piece of land would eventually become the land Glenn Rudd owned, turned part into some of the Baptist Hill Cemetery today. He received 65 acres of land from the McKinley Avenue to Dean Road area in November of 1911, the neighborhood just north of where the Baptist Hill Cemetery is located today. Glenn saw the need for the growth of the Black Cemetery and sold some of his land to go to that cause. The selling of these pieces of land located towards the north of his po property was signed off by the Lee County Court in December of 1920. Glenn died on February 7, 1960 at his house on Dean Road in Auburn. He left behind his wife Rhoda, his two daughters Glenn and Eloise, and his two brothers Levi and Tommy Rudd. The funeral was officiated by Reverend G. Stafford and Reverend W. M. Bodie at Lee's Chapel AME Church of Auburn. A lifelong member of this church buried in the southwest corner of the land he sold to the community at Baptist Hill. His grave lays on the edge of the cemetery facing away from Dean Road. From the three separate years of ad purchased by his family to the local paper, it is obvious he was missed greatly by his wife and children. Glenn Rudd, an African-American man in the 1930s owning land, especially owning land in the deep south, it was astonishing. At this period in history, racial discrimination and segregation was at its peak making Rudd's contributions even more worthy of recognition. Over his life, Rudd did a lot for the African-American community. He helped provide land for lost loved ones in the African-American community. He helped build the first training school for African-Americans in Lee County and fashioned the pews at the first African Methodist Episcopal Church in Lee County. These actions by Rudd during his lifetime proved that he was a very generous and giving man with what he had earned and helped those who were less fortunate than him. The land he provided for the cemetery allowed those who came before us to be honored, remembered, and visited by their loving family members. Rudd is a perfect example of the ability to overcome the false narrative that African Americans were dependent on others to change their situation, disproving the passive belief in the need for a white hero. Good morning. I'm Willie Muse. I uh, was asked to give about a three minute block of my experience uh, as a sharecropper on the farm many, many years ago. Uh, as you know, back in the day when we were born, there was only uh, slavery had been over uh, a, 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 a hundred years at that time. But we were sharecroppers. We got caught up in that sharecropping era. And we were, as young people, we were obligated to carry our role in the field at a very early age, whether it was hoeing or picking cotton. And uh, while we were in the field, if we were too young to pick cotton or carry a row, we were water boys. We would carry water to the person, the field hands who worked in the field. It was then uh, later on when we as working in the field that we experienced planes flying overhead. And we learned that those, those planes were pilots being trained for war far, far away, which was actually in Europe. And uh, that was World War II. 
and we uh, and 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 we learned that uh, that that they, they would buzz us from time to time as we worked in the field. And then one day there was a squadron of plane planes approaching, and 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 they sort of buzzed us in a sense. And then we as we as we looked, they tilted the plane so that we could see in the cockpit. And, and, and in the cockpit, there were a black man. They called him colored in that day and time. And he waved at us and others followed suit. And they waved at us and then they went on out in the field and started doing their maneuvers. And we learned later on as Mr. X came by, he was the landlord. He came by and he had us to know that they were experimenting with some black folk or colored folk over at Tuskegee Institute to see if they could, could follow our claims. And it so happened that those persons were able to fly planes. They turned out to be the Tuskegee Airmen. In the military, they were the red tails who escorted bombs during the bombers during World War II. And to us, they were represented a glimmer of hope for us in the field, for we realized that black people, colored people could do anything that anybody else could do. That was a glimmer of hope for us, even from Dallas County or Hill, Alabama. My experiences with the AP students at Auburn High School has been extraordinary. I say with confidence that both groups worked tirelessly on this project. I would never forget the labs as well as the insight I shared with the white group that consisted of Lauren, Emmy, Shayla, and Ryan, as well as the plethora of knowledge I was able to provide the blue group that consisted of Wesley Ann, Johan, Aaron, and Claire. I knew that I possessed a passion for teaching and education, but it was only intensified by working with those diligent and ambitious AP students at Auburn High. Each student possessed an unquenchable thirst for knowledge, which was impressive to me. As we review the life story of Blanche Carter, an activist for housing and equal rights in Auburn, we discovered that there was more to the story than what the eyes can see. Blanche was a caring mother, loving wife, preacher and teacher of righteousness, and to me, she was one of the frontline foot soldiers in the fight for equality in Auburn. We learned about Carter's experiences with racism and much more. No doubt, some of those experiences were very painful, but she did not let them bring her down. As an African-American journalist and storyteller, I took delight in the opportunity to share the story of one of the most remarkable unsung heroes in African-American community in Auburn. I felt that it was my obligation to investigate and answer the who, what, when, why, and how as it pertains to the life of Blanche Carter. Under the leadership of Dr. Robert Bubb and Ms. Caitlin Halperin, this wonderful opportunity was indeed fruitful. The information was provided by Ms. Linda Carter, daughter of Blanche Carter, and for that I want to extend a warm and personal thank you. I will cherish the memories and moments from my work with those magnificent AP students at Auburn High School. Blanche Carter was born on the 18th of May in 1927. Although her tombstone displays her birth year as 1930, after she and her brother switched birthdays to delay him from being drafted. She was an extremely hardworking woman and important figure of the Auburn community. She was born into a sharecropping family in Waverly, Alabama. Sharecropping usually consists of a white landowner who owns a plot of land and a black family that farms it in return for a share of the yield. This process kept black people from owning their own land and having power. Sharecroppers might have had the chance to work land for themselves, but they still stayed dependent upon the white landowners or fell into debt to merchants. Blanche's mother came to have her own piece of land to rent and to raise her children on. Blanche's life was hard, but she had to work even harder as a black woman to achieve the goals white people gained easily. She graduated from high school in Lafayette, Alabama. This was incredibly significant. Blanche valued the education and family over all else. After high school, she moved to Columbus, Georgia, and then to Auburn, where she married Dardell Carter. After Blanche and Dardell were married, the couple went on to have six children. Their children's names were Linda, Dwayne, Dardell Jr., Alfonso, Beverly, and Shirley. Raising children in the segregated South was incredibly difficult for Black families, and Blanche's was no exception. Even recreational activities were hard to accomplish. 
For example, what is now Five Guys in downtown Auburn used to be called Tiger Theaters. At one point, she and her family were barred from entering the Tiger Theaters for no reason other than their race. She and her husband worked excruciating hours and odd jobs. Blanche worked many domestic jobs, most likely as a housemaid or cook, but those were unstable and paid poorly. Unfortunately, a few years after their last child, her husband passed away after battling terminal illness. This left Blanche Carter as a single mother of six children in the Deep South. In the 1950s and 60s in the Deep South, Blanche, a black woman, had to earn enough income to provide for her six children as a single mother. To make a living, she began working as a servant. This was a common enough job for a black woman at the time, but was also extremely unstable in terms of income. It's important to point out, much like sharecropping, black people were held from power in the workplace as well. Oftentimes, especially in the South, the black community as a whole was denied well-paying jobs, which still have repercussions today. Despite the adversity and discrimination, Blanche incorporated family values from her childhood into her household. She heavily emphasized fighting for education and equality and was involved in the community. She also emphasized maintaining their Christian faith, but she didn't stop there. Blanche wanted good childhoods for all the children in Auburn. Blanche founded the Auburn Housing Authority Tenant Council after Dardell died in her limited free time. The council aimed to help earn equal housing opportunities for the African-American community in Auburn. Additionally, she helped volunteer for the community basketball games to support Auburn's black youth. Blanche was also very religious, and she was highly involved in her church, Lee Chapel Church. She went to church every Sunday with her kids and kept her faith strong. Blanche went to almost every single city council meeting to fight for black housing in the Drake Apartments and to gain equal housing for all. She also fought to increase the quality of black education in Auburn at what was then Drake High School and what is now Drake Middle School. Blanche's dream job was to become a nurse. Unfortunately, she couldn't achieve her dream because of the discrimination and hardships of the time. She instead focused on helping the next generation be able to achieve their dreams. And that is an incredible sacrifice to make. Blanche Carter deserves to be remembered. Ultimately, Blanche Carter gave up her dream job to help the black community fight for equal rights and education. In doing so, she not only contributed to the upbringing of black children, but she also taught the children to have manners and civility, even in the face of discrimination and hardships. She was a foundational member of the black community who fought for equal housing opportunities and safe, fun, happy childhoods for all black children in Auburn. The importance. Gatsy Rice is an Auburn woman who we all should know. She was from Auburn and was a very successful and well-known. Gatsy Rice owned a lot of property and could read and write which is highly unusual for a formerly enslaved person. Although she didn't have any rights, Gatsy was still extremely successful. Most importantly, she acted as an inspiration for a newly freed African-American woman in the South. What were her contributions? Well, Gatsy owned a lot of property in present day downtown Auburn. She owned a boarding house for cadets and a shop where she was a seamstress and a hat maker. She also owned two houses, one in Auburn and one in Opelika, and a sizable amount of land in Tuskegee. She gave her land to her son and daughter, who later sold it at an auction. What was her early life, her job, and what was known of her family? Though her exact birth date is unknown, Gatsy Rice was born around 1832. She lived in Auburn, Alabama as an enslaved person and a nanny for Alicia Milton, which likely consisted of a vigorous lifestyle. While she was enslaved, Gatsy was expected to follow orders with no complaints, and her freedom of movement and choices of activities were most likely restricted. She was probably not free to express her own opinions while she was serving her mistress. Though she was not formally educated, she had multiple jobs, including a seamstress and a hat maker. She helped start a boarding house for students where she could cook and clean for them. Because Gatsy was able to accomplish all this without formal education, we can conclude that she was highly intelligent. She also owned almost 250 acres of land in Macon County, which again was unusual for a formerly enslaved woman. By owning a business and, a man and managing properties, we are able to see her hard work ethic and strategic mind through her legacy as a successful black woman. Before 1880, her husband passed away and she was known as the widow. Gatsy's children, Nancy and Willie, inherited, inherited her land after her death in 1896. Pine Hill Cemetery. 
Pine Hill Cemetery was an all-white cemetery during the 1830s and all the way through the 1960s. However, some African Americans were buried there, Gatsy being one of them. This didn't happen often, and when it did, it was when they were enslaved, buried on the outskirts of the cemetery. But Gatsy asked to be buried there um, after Baptist Hill was built, Baptist Hill being an African American cemetery. Now, why was she buried in Pine Hill instead? We, we, we like to believe that she wanted to be buried near her husband who died before her and to be nearer to enslaved persons that had passed away and was buried without markers. That brings us to Gatsy Rice being the only African American to be buried with the marker in Pine Hill Cemetery. This also creates the idea that she was seen as more than just an enslaved person to others in the community and her request to have her accomplishments, accomplishments recognized by a marker backs this idea. Who was Gatsy Rice as a person? Well, from this historical evidence, we can say that Gatsy Rice was devoted to her husband as she became known as the widow. Gatsy was also family oriented as she had accumulated a lot of land, a very large amount of land, which is quite the achievement given her circumstances and gave her property to her children. From this, we can say that Gatsy was overall a loving and caring person who put others needs before her own. An example of this is when she was man managing a boarding house to take care of all those kids. We can also assume that she was very intelligent as managing to acquire the amount of land that she did during the time was not an easy feat. And her creation of a will shelter her investment in the future generations. Her story is inspirational because Gatsu was born at a double disadvantage, being black and being a woman during that time period. But she still managed to be free of slavery and started her own business. This teaches the youth that despite their upbringings or wherever they came from or were born from, they can achieve great things. It inspired me because as a black person, I can understand her feelings of being born as a, as a disadvantage because of our skin color. But I have my own skills and talents to pursue my goals with help from, from God and Jesus. Hi everyone. My name is Ashley Brown, and I, along with Olivia Nichols, are the co-founders of the Lee County Remembrance Project. We have a partnership with Equal Justice Initiative that allows for us to shine a light on the racial injustices experienced by John Moss, George Hart, Charles Humphreys, and Samuel Harris. Thank you for telling these stories and for raising awareness of these buried truths here in Lee County. By telling these stories, you are confronting the reality of our past and shining a light on the legacies which have stemmed from it. Truth telling is brave, important work and absolutely necessary to truly reconcile the racial violence and injustice that has occurred here and around the nation. Please continue to be a beacon of light and inspiration. Mahatma Gandhi says it best, be the change you wish to see in the world. And you all are doing just that. Men, women, black or white, we are all entitled to a second chance. We all deserve the right to due process or fair treatment through the normal judicial system. But above all else, we deserve our story to be told. This is the story of Charles Green Miller. In his early childhood, Miller lived with his grandmother as sharecroppers. He didn't spend much time in school, but through the years, he learned to read and write. In his older years, Miller lived a simple life in his Opelika home with his wife, Rosa Lee, and one roommate. He held steady work at the railroads, working long hours and days. But the work was dangerous and required heavy labor. The Great Depression took a toll on his work, lowering wages and increasing unemployment rates. Not only did it impact Miller, it also affected other railroad industrial workers in Alabama. According to Lee County Sheriff William Samuel Buck Jones, he saw Miller as a good fellow. Charles Miller's life took a turn for the worse in the summer of 1932. According to news reports at the time, Charles Miller allegedly destroyed his entire house and slit his wife's throat on June 29, 1932. Afterwards, he traveled to his brother-in-law's with a shotgun. Miller then attempted to shoot his brother-in-law and his wife. We do not know why here, but we do know he wanted to scare them. They only suffered minor injuries because he fired into a nearby tub where their hands were, 
not directly at them. A few hours later, Sheriff Buck received a call detailing where Miller would be found and offered to go and speak to Miller. As he left, he reportedly said, he's a good fellow, he won't give me any trouble. The connection between Sheriff and Miller remains unknown. When the sheriff opened the door, he was shot in the chest and died shortly after. It is at this time, according to the sheriff's family, Miller reportedly said, Oh, Mr. Buck, I didn't know it was you. He then fled the scene. Shortly after the news of the death of Sheriff Buck, a mob formed to kill Miller. They shot him between 100 to 150 times and, quote, tore him to pieces. His body was then left on the steps of the courthouse. This is important because the mob wanted everyone to see what they had done to Miller. Similar to most lynchings and hate crimes, it was not only a form of punishment to the victim, but a message of terror to other people not to step out of line. In addition, by leaving Miller in front of the courthouse, it solidified their ideology that they were serving justice for the death of the sheriff. It was also important to add that because Miller was killed before he received the right of due process, we will never know why or if he even killed his wife and threatened to harm his brother and sister-in-law. The legacy Charles Miller left in the Opelika community has been controversial since the incident 88 years ago. Sheriff Jones died embraced as a hero, protecting the town he loved. Miller, on the other hand, died seen as a murderer. However, we can't be sure of what really transpired. Technically, he was never found guilty and therefore died an innocent man, but the mob that shot him roughly a hundred times got to go home, see their families, and go to work the next day when no one thought anything of it. Opposed to the belief that he deserved his fate, Miller never received the opportunity as an American citizen of due process. Without the rule of a judge, we will never understand Miller's case to the full extent. We will never know Miller's relationship with his wife, his brother-in-law, his sister-in-law, and Sheriff Jones. Miller's fate was instead decided out of the oppressive tyranny enforced by the white mob. This tragedy is important not only to Opelika, but to all of America because it compels you to think critically about what it means to die without justice, to die without your story being heard. If you take nothing else from this story, walk away knowing that true justice does not discriminate. Between the years 1877 and 1950, somewhere around 4,400 black men, women, and children were lynched without a fair trial to prove accusations. Alabama was arguably one of the worst states in the terms of racial discrimination, and Lee County is no exception. The history of lynchings is typically not talked about in detail or is just taught on in broad terms that you nor the people themselves who suffered this fate because people do not looking at the er earlier parts of history. However, this is unfair to everyone who has been impacted by lynchings and are still being impacted because society has changed only to mask injustices and not correct them. A local justice center would solve this issue of ignorance because it could give the public a chance to learn about the injustices their own community committed. It would represent a connection between the past and moving forward to be better. More importantly, it would tell stories of actual people who were brushed aside in the history books because people didn't want to acknowledge that their communities were not perfect. Let's go into a few stories that could be featured in the Justice Center. On a summer day of 1932, Sheriff Buck Jones was sent to arrest a black man named Charles Green for attempted murder. However, at the time, newspapers made lynching victims appear as much of the villain as they can in order to keep popular support. Miller fired into a wash tub, not at the people he was accused of trying to murder. In the process, the two people did get buck buckshot in their hands, but there is no reported evidence that he tried to kill him. Buck, before leaving, was heard saying that Charles Green was a good man and wouldn't be any trouble. When the sheriff opened the door, Charles shot him point blank with a shotgun. Charles said, Mr. Buck, I didn't know it was you before fleeing it from town. A few hours later, mob catches up with him for four, four miles out of town. As they caught up with him, they called for him to stop. He just kept going. One shot him and others joined in and shot him more than 50 times before his body was dragged onto the courthouse lawn.
On November 3, 1902, an armed white mob sees Samuel Harris, a black man picking cotton in a field, when two white women reported a robbery and assault nearby in Salem. Hours later, with no evidence implicating Mr. Harris in the crimes, over 125 men shot him to death. His pregnant wife, Patrice, was arrested as an accomplice. On March 17, 1900, a white teenager reported being startled when she saw Charles Humphreys, a young black employee of her father, in her room. The next morning, a mob of white men went to his home near Phoenix City and shot him over 40 times. Two cousins, John Moss and George Hart, worked for the Waldrop family. Edmund Waldrop Jr. went missing, so a search party went out the next day to look for the 21-year-old. John and George were the first to find Edmund's body. The white majority began to spin stories of how John Moss and George Hart had killed him instead of finding him. John Moss fled for his safety but was caught by a mob of white men and was hung and then burned. George Hart was arrested and was waiting trial papers in the Opelika jail. He was most likely going to be freed and not charged of the crime. When the people heard of this, a group of white men broke into the jail and kidnapped George Hart. They hung him on the same tree they hung John Moss on. They placed a note on his back that said, This hung by a hundred determined men. Whoever cuts him down would suffer his fate. No one was ever charged with the murder of these two men. The center is an educational center for the community to learn about the history of lynching in the county and a memorial outside the educational center. The memorial outside will feature a monument of a dead cypress tree made of cords that has four chains entangling around its trunk that link to four plaques surrounding the tree that each display the story of a lynching in Lee County. They will be placed upon an engraved quartz map of Lee County in the relative location of where they died. There will be benches next to each plaque in order for people to sit, read, and reflect. The monument will be made out of Alabama quartz, which is local to the state and was commonly mined by slaves. It reflects the purity of lives that were tragically cut short. The cypress tree represents death, and the chains represent the bondage of terror that lynching left on the black community. At the beginning of the museum section, or the educational system, I want to give everyone a card with the name of a victim with a barcode. As they go through each section, they scan the code to get more info on the person, eventually learning about their death. It will hit the idea of the wrongdoings effect whole. The idea of a justice center is not new, but is important. We need to recognize our past and do it in a way that puts wrongdoings on display in order to be able to take the next step forward. We cannot earn social equality for everyone if we try to erase what's been holding back progress. If we do not educate future generations, the history of our community will be forgotten. Using these stories, the monument, and the education center, we can achieve these goals. Hello, everyone. My name is Barbara Giddens Bethany. My father, Josh Giddens Jr., was Josh Sr. and Addie Giddens' youngest son. This is a great honor for my grandparents in recognition of their contribution to the community over a century ago. To be able to provide a resting place for African-Americans whose families could not afford to bury them was indeed an act of unselfishness, kindness, generosity, and love straight from the heart. This occurred during a time in history when African-Americans were suppressed by slavery and education was not a priority. Most could not read or write but my grandfather was an exception. He strived for success and he succeeded. He became a businessman in his own rights. Growing up, the older grandchildren who knew my grandparents would joke about him being tight with money, but in a good way. I was too young at the time to understand fully what they meant. But because of your research, I now know. I call that good money management and time well spent. He had a dream to provide a better life for his wife and five children. He was able to start investing in land and real estate properties in 1901 at the early age of around 28. 
The cemetery was part of his first investment. After my grandparents' death, his children maintained and continued his legacy. I am so thankful to all of you and the research group for bringing their story to life. It means so much to me to learn where my humble beginnings started. My father and his siblings were all wonderful, caring people. Because of my grandparents, we all lived a comfortable life and I was able to get a college degree. Your research and essays have been above excellent. I know my grandparents are watching with a big smile on their face, full of love, gratitude, and thanks. I'm so proud to be their granddaughter. Remember, in spite of all the odds stacked against them, they prove that there is always a bright light of success. You have to believe in it, reach for it, set your goals, and stay focused. Thanks again, and best wishes to all of you. Goodbye. The proposed Giddens Memorial Park is being built to honor not only the Giddens family for their good works, but to honor the formerly enslaved people buried in the cemetery. George and Abby Giddens allowed people who were unable to afford to be buried in the city cemetery a place of eternal rest on their property. Most graves remain unmarked, and despite the inability to recognize each person buried by name, the memorial will honor all lives, known and unknown. One African-American woman, Coriana Hardy, and her daughter, Viola Johnson, are buried in the cemetery possibly along with her husband Monroe and likely other family members. A high achieving woman by the name Charlene Giddens Hall was also buried in the cemetery. She graduated with the first class of the Lee County Training School, the first school to offer a high school education to African Americans in this area. It is important to recognize the formerly enslaved people buried in the cemetery, but also the history behind the institution of slavery. The Giddens Memorial Park is intended to represent faith, hard work, and perseverance. To do this, the Memorial Park will be filled with symbolism to reflect these values. Around the park, Strelitza, an orange flower also known as Bird of Paradise flower, which is known to represent freedom and immortality, will be planted as well as irises. Blue flowers known to represent hope, faith, and wisdom. Apple and pear trees will be planted throughout the park. The apple tree has been associated with Aphrodite's and known as the tree of love. The pear tree represents inner peace. The cemetery is a place of eternal rest and peace for formerly enslaved people. Everything in the memorial will be symbolic of overcoming discrimination and the Giddens' success. Lastly, a statue that represents the work of George and Addie Giddens placed in the center of the memorial to represent them together, watching over their family, friends, and loved ones. This statue will honor their work and celebrate their lives of the known and unknown buried in the cemetery. The difficulties African Americans faced during the slave period didn't end with emancipation. Alabama's ratification of the 13th Amendment in December of 1865 may have outlawed slavery in the states, but it was far from ending discrimination or solving the difficulties facing newly freed enslaved African Americans. The first of many inequalities these freed slaves encountered was not truly knowing their age. Birthdays weren't recorded, which meant ages were estimated in the state of federal censuses. This often led to varying ages from one census to the next, meaning that the true age of many who are buried there, including George and Addie Giddens and others such as Gloriana Hardy, are unknown. One of the other problems facing African Americans was the difficulty of purchasing and owning their own land. Fewer educational opportunities and prior income meant the recently freed slaves often had to work as sharecroppers. This made it hard for them to save enough money to purchase land of their own, since sharecropping was meant to keep African Americans impoverished and shackled to the land they were once enslaved on. Therefore, it was rare at the time for African Americans to own land or run their own farms. George Giddens was an exception to this with the acres he purchased in 1901. George Giddens was a black man born around the year of 1865, and Addison Giddens was born around the year of 1880. They both were farmers and grew up poor. They got married and had five kids together, two sons and three daughters. The Giddens purchased 54.5 acres of farmland in current-day Opelika, and we want to find a way to commemorate the Giddens with their land. The memorial is meant to bring focus to the fact that during this time, not many formerly enslaved people or even freed black people could afford to bury their dead relatives. Therefore, the Giddens let them bury their dead on their land for free. 
The Giddens were good people who wanted to help the community and their success in being free and owning land demonstrated equal opportunities. The Giddens started as poor farmers who ended up having a big impact on the community through their generosity. In order to maintain the memorial, we have decided on a route focused on fundraising and volunteer work. The memorial may be able to gain money through public taxes or donations. A seasonal way to earn money would be through the fruit trees, such as pear and apple trees. Guests who visit the memorial will be able to pick the fruit and the money will go towards maintenance. A special team of volunteers, such as churches, school clubs, and cemetery associations, will be organized to provide maintenance such as cleaning and lawn work. The parking lot will directly connect to the pathway, which will be decorated front and center by a beautiful statue representing peace, and plaques containing history of all the known people buried at the memorial will decorate the sides of the path. The pathway will be paved and decorated with many flowers with specific meanings as well as fruit trees. There will be a bathroom that will be well kept as well as a large beautiful wooden gazebo. An outdoor classroom will be built to serve as a location for school groups to come and be further educated on our city's history. The classroom will be in the form of a smaller amphitheater. It will be a beautiful spot based on the history of the Giddens family and the formerly enslaved people buried on the land. The success of George and Addie Giddens goes further than their backyard. Their hard work symbolized perseverance and determination and led to a big step towards the hope of equality and inspiration for what could be achieved. The memorial represents their values and will serve to educate others in hopes to broaden the understanding of our local history. My name is Jada Ashford, and I am a senior majoring in biomedical sciences from Birmingham, Alabama. And my project is on the untold story of Robert Frazier. And I mainly chose this story because I am a former athlete myself and a big sports fan. And I wanted to learn more about Robert Frazier and his background and his contributions to the Q University. Um, working with the high school students has been a great opportunity for me just getting to know them and teaching them about um, historical documentation. And um, they have been a joy to work with, very enthusiastic, wanting to learn more. And um, this class is a great addition to the Auburn University. And I think it's gonna be around for a while and learning about the um, untold contributions of African-Americans in Auburn university i um, mean through this class i've also um, been able to learn more about my family history in itself so i look forward to um, the students presentations in this class going forward while there's not much information about robert frazier's early life we do know a few things leading up to his role as the first mascot of auburn university robert frazier was born in 1873 to william frazier a farmer and his mother, Dora Eccles, a maid. Together, his parents, who undoubtedly experienced enslavement, instilled important work ethics into his livelihood that he would carry all the way into his adulthood. He worked as a butcher at a meat market, though this and many other jobs weren't mentioned in the federal census, including farming. Instead, the census had him working as a porter at the university. He had some experience as an athlete, but he still couldn't compete at the high school or college level because there were no African-American schools in Auburn until 1928. Robert Frazier was married to Dotsie Hall in 1899. Together, they had 10 children, six boys and four girls, forcing him to hold several jobs, including being a longtime employee for the Auburn Athletics Department. Some of his children, Henry, Robert, and William Frazier, worked for Auburn University. His older boys worked as janitors, butchers, and farmers, and the girls worked as cooks or maids. They owned a large family home on Glen Avenue worth about $5,000. At the time, this was a large investment. After his death, many of his children continued living in their West Glen family home as late as 1940. Robert clearly valued education as every member of his family learned to read and write. This was uncommon for the time and it shows he truly wanted a better life for his children. During Robert's time working for Auburn University, he worked several jobs like athletic trainer, equipment worker, rubber down boy, water boy, mud boy, and was occasionally selected for the role of mascot. At the time, Auburn was one of the largest employers of African Americans, but they were mostly relegated to service jobs. During his tenure as a mascot for Auburn's football team, he was given the nickname Bob Sponsor, though the term sponsor was generally only used for female students who danced around at games. 
Record state he danced and paraded around the stadium whilst being cheered and booed by respective audiences. He was said to be well liked, though it is clear he was not respected by the community, and he was a friend to Auburn students. At Auburn, he was heavily discriminated against. One time at Auburn's first game against Georgia in, in 1892, coach George Petrie chose Frazier as the team's mascot. Initially, Georgia wanted to choose Lewis Green, an elderly blind black man who lived outside of the stadium. Georgia chose to use a goat instead, resulting in a comparison of Frazier to that of an animal. 1892 was not the last time he would be degraded at a football game, as in 1912, his beloved Auburn Tigers left him in Atlanta, resulting in him being shipped to Auburn in a box on instructions from the Georgia team. Even though Frazier's contributions to Auburn athletics go unrecognized, he was an integral part of Auburn's early football teams and can be seen as a pioneer of African-American involvement in Auburn athletics before the integration of the university in 1964. The first black athletes did not arrive until 1968 with the arrival of Henry Harris, the first black basketball player, James Owens in 1969, the first black football player on scholarship, and Thomas Gossam Jr. in 1971, the first black athlete in the SEC to walk on, earn a scholarship, and graduate. Frazier felt ill after the 1920 season, and Auburn students paid for his treatment in Atlanta, but it was unsuccessful. Auburn students then paid for his treatment in Mobile. His condition never improved, and he wanted to return to Auburn to die. He passed away on June 19, 1921. He was buried the next day in Baptist Hill Cemetery, the first primary black cemetery in Auburn. Frazier was a member of the Mosaic Templars of America, one of the largest black fraternal organizations at the time, founded by two formerly enslaved persons. The Templars provided business and nursing schools and physical education classes to the community. The funding for his funeral came mostly from Auburn students, showing they truly cared for him. His gravestone had an engraving from the Templars, the same fraternity Booker T. Washington belonged. Washington and Frazier shared the same values of education and self-improvement, and, and it is fitting his headstone still bears the mark of their shared fraternity, the Mosaic, the Mosaic Templars. He was seen as one of the most prominent African Americans in athletic circles at the time. He worked with Auburn University and athletics decades before integration and before black athletes. Through the discrimination he faced, he continued to work with Auburn University, whether this was for his love of athletics or the love of his family. He continued to work regardless. Frazier was known throughout the town, and he was truly an Auburn man and cared about the African-American community through his membership with the Templars. He's part of Auburn's history, even if it is seen as a negative side. In the past, his contributions weren't recognized as he was seen as a more of a form of entertainment rather than a human being. Today, Auburn still fails to recognize Frazier's contributions to avoid the negative attention their history of discrimination would bring. While it may be negative attention to the university, it is important to celebrate Robert Frazier and the history of Auburn. Hi, my name is Emily McElhaney. I'm a senior at Auburn University, majoring in Human Development and Family Sciences and minoring in Psychology. I had the privilege of being able to mentor some amazing AP US History students from Auburn High School as we plan a centennial event for Robert Frazier. I chose to help them plan this event because once I heard who Robert Frazier was, I decided he needed an event that was as uplifting and inspirational as he was. I hope you enjoy the presentation that the students worked so hard on. Robert Frazier, a family man, was loved by many and known to the public as Auburn's first documented hometown mascot. Abby, no, not that type of mascot, and not what we should remember. We should remember that he was a father of many children, a hard worker, someone who was persistent in the face of oppression, providing for his family when the cards were against him. Robert Frazier, a family man, that's why we celebrate his life. We want to hold an event for his 100th anniversary of his death and remind our community of his dedication and love for Auburn. At the beginning of the centennial event, there will be an introduction to the day, Juneteenth. There will be a pamphlet given out at the entrance of the library highlighting the importance of the day. The pamphlet will also mention the irony and symbolism of Juneteenth and Robert Frazier. Even after nearly 60 years after emancipation, Robert Frazier could still not live fairly due to the lack of equality and freedom for African Americans. Pamphlet will include information such as 
Juneteenth is a day celebrating the emancipation of those enslaved in the United States because on June 19th, 1865, the Union Army General Gordon Granger claimed emancipation in Texas. There will be posters on stands around the amphitheater with quick facts about the centennial event and Juneteenth. This will give the audience important information that will hopefully open their minds to the discrimination that still occurred even in the U.S. after emancipation. Unfortunately, African Americans still face discrimination today, 155 years after emancipation. This event is just another small step forward to eliminating racial prejudice and discrimination towards African Americans. Robert Fraser did everything for his family, and it's only right that we recognize and honor that. The main event itself could be held at the amphitheater at the public library. To remember the event, pins will be handed out. To raise money to restore other unkept headstones of African Americans in the community, items such as t-shirts and refreshments could be sold to fundraise. For half the event, visitors can walk around, socialize with other people, and learn more about Mr. Robert Frazier and Juneteenth. While the socializing aspect of the event is happening, a short video cast on a projector will be playing on the background screen. We will hopefully collaborate with another group also researching the story of Robert Frazier to create the film. It will include moments of Robert Frazier's life and who he was. For example, it will talk about his family life and his work life. Towards the end, the film will cover what being a mascot at Auburn University, what Mr. Frazier might most commonly be known for, truly meant during this day and age, a character to poke fun at and serve for entertainment for the crowd, even in the most hurtful ways. Auburn University is working to improve race relations, so the video will address at the end. After the video plays and the audience has a grasp on who Robert Frazier is, we'll have his family, if any of them are willing, of course, to come on stage and share how they were related to Mr. Robert Frazier and explain what his story means to them, how his story has affected their lives, and what they would want the world to know about Mr. Robert Frazier and his story. They could share stories about him and talk about what kind of person he was. If they don't live locally but want to share something about him, we could hold a Zoom call so they could talk about him. Because Mr. Frazier is most often known as being the first mascot of Auburn, the current basketball team and football team, if willing, will come to the event. A few African-American players will then talk about how racial prejudices have changed in the sport and discrimination they still might face to this day and what more they believe can be done in Auburn to stop racism they may have experienced. At the end of the event, close friends and family of Robert Frazier will walk across the street to the cemetery where he is buried. It will be kept to those only close family because cemetery is a place of reverence. They will all congregate around his grave where we will unveil the headstone that has been restored. With the headstone, we will clean off all the dirt and mold. We will also make it easier to read. On a separate plaque, we will add his history and legacy, keeping his story alive to anybody who comes to the cemetery. By keeping the headstone and restoring it, it allows us to remember his past because you need not just move on but remember the past. While the family is watching the unveiling, there will be a reception for all the other guests at the amphitheater. It is important to know the history on who Robert Fraser really was. Not a mascot, but a man. A husband, a father, a son. Not taking defeat, but working hard despite the racism in society. Creating a deeper meaning to Juneteenth. A powerful reminder that we can always grow as a people. Juneteenth is a day where we can show the striving spirit of African Americans and show Auburn's African American heritage. Through this project, I learned that there was a lot more uh, black history in Auburn than I realized, and through this outdoor classroom assignment, I can spread it to more people. Learn more about the black community in our local area and rewriting the false black baby narrative that black success is only based in the time of the play. Um, I learned that there are not many records about Baptist Hill and other uh, black landmarks from this time period due to racism and segregation. So while Baptist Hill Cemetery has approximately 400 graves, um, around 100 of them are unmarked. And so the preservation of Baptist Hill is the preservation of the unrecorded mystery of its history. There's a lot about the historical significance of the black history in Baptist Hill Cemetery. And now whenever I drive by it, I can think about all the stuff that I learned.
I learned more about the experiences of African Americans in Lee County. Uh, I learned about the social aspects of Black history in Auburn, specifically about like housing and like raising children and sport and the community. I learned that uh, why we can ignore the past and kind of ignore what happens uh, in our society, well, our cities and area where it's better to kind of embrace it and be more open to a discussion about it. I learned about Robert Fraser's life and his legacy in the university. Um, well, with this project, I'm still kind of learning about Auburn's history. And because of this, I was able to learn about some of the parts of it that we may not like to talk about, but it's helped me put a name and a face and a background and a story with all these ideas that we hear of discrimination. It helped me truly see that these are real people, real things happen to this. And it's helped me understand that Auburn is changing and it's changing for the better, but changes still can be made and are still needing to be made to this day. What I learned from this project was the amount of thought and planning that goes into making a public space, such as the one that we are planning to make for the Giddens Memorial. Well, not only did I learn like the researching aspect, especially for like more historical things that it's a lot harder to find information for, but I also just learned a lot about uh, Auburn University and uh, how it how it began and like the origins of its mascot, not just from uh, like the stories that we hear when we're like younger, but more like the older things that are more put away in history. About Auburn's first mascot, which was Robert Frazier, and I learned about his many contributions to Auburn's uh, community that many people don't know about. Dr. Bub, um, I don't know if we can hear you. Thanks. That's probably better. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah, we want to thank you for sharing your valuable time with us this evening. Uh, we hope that the, the students' presentations were enlightening and informative. And we hope that you it got you thinking about the, the local history here in, in the Lee County area. Um, hopefully, um, it's going to lead you to, to want to know more, and, and I look forward to, to future semesters where we can tell a few more of these, these stories um, that are untold, uh, but very valuable to, to our community. Uh, I, I know I mentioned this at the beginning, um, but I, I'll mention it again. I'm con continually impressed by our young people, and the more I work with them, the more I'm encouraged for the future of our country, and I think just in humanity in general. Um, I look forward to their future success, and, and I hope that um, for some of them, maybe they'll end up at Auburn University in a few years uh, and into the, the HF 4950 course. I think that would be that would be wonderful. Um, before we leave tonight, there are several people that we want to acknowledge on behalf of this project. Um, following the acknowledgments, uh, we will have a brief question and answer um, period. Uh, if you have questions that you would like to ask one of us, feel free to, to leave it in the comments. Um, but first and foremost, foremost, I want to thank our students. They've done a tremendous job with these stories, uh, both the high school students and the university students. I just can't say uh, enough about them. Um, I also have to thank Ms. Caitlin Halperin. And if I could give an award, I think it would be to her. The time she has dedicated to her students is worthy, uh, uh, certainly a, of note. Um, and, I, and I don't feel that my contributions are anywhere near what she has contributed to these particular stories. Uh, she is truly an amazing, amazing teacher. Uh, when the joint class had to go virtual for our meetings, uh, she made sure that uh, my students um, and also myself could contact remotely with her students. Uh, this meant that she was in the classroom with the students going from group to group um, and really helping the, the students translate what we were, what we were saying through, the, through um, the virtual and through the computer. She also made sure that the project progressed and she checked everyone's uh, work before we even saw it, including the videos you saw tonight. So um, I know uh, following this semester, I know that, that um, she and I will, will sit down, we'll talk about the, the semester and how we can improve upon it for the CESA going into this semester. We also have to thank uh, those descendants and community members who put in their time to read um, and review the students' drafts. Uh, and uh, some of them even guest lectured to our university students. So I'm incredibly grateful for that. Uh, what we have done this semester would not be possible without, without them. Uh, several of them also provided research themselves and documentation that we were able to use for, for some of these stories. Additionally, we have to thank Maven, uh, Maven Beard and Mark Wilson at the Caroline Marshall Drawn Center for the Arts and Humanities for hosting tonight's event. Uh, we have worked uh, with them on several projects, 
and, uh, and they've always been supportive of, of what we do. So we're very appreciative to them. Uh, we can't forget Auburn City Schools. Their administration allowed us to, to have this joint class with the high school mm -hmm. students. And so we look forward to those future semesters working together uh, with them again to tell these stories. Um, the Human Development and Family Studies Department here at Auburn has been incredibly supportive as I have pursued this research. I'm grateful personally to Angela Wiley for allowing me to hold this HFS 4950 course and to pursue these stories as well. Um, a few last quick uh, thank yous um, to Laura Ariori, Ariori, who showed us how to get a story map up and running. Mm -hmm. uh, she was too humble to acknowledge, uh, uh, be acknowledged in the presentation, but I would be remiss if I didn't, didn't do it here. Also to Anna Young at BillionGraves.com. Uh, she sent us the GPS coordinates for the headstones at Baptist Hill Cemetery. Uh, finally, uh, Janelle Vasquez at Family Search asked us to present at Roots Tech Conference, the Roots Tech Conference this year, uh, about uh, the process of creating this course, and so we look forward to that presentation in, in February. If you're not familiar with, familiar with Roots Tech, the conference is virtual this year. Uh, it's also free, so if you want to start your own family history research, this would be a great conference to get you started. Um, I am sure that I'm forgetting several people. Um, if I am forgetting you, my apologies. Um, let me know if that is the case. I'll make sure that you're in Wednesday's uh, acknowledgements as well. So um, on Wednesday night, we'll see the, the white class days presentations. The topics are the same as today, but their interpretations of the stories will differ slightly uh, and they emphasize different aspects um, to those stories. Um, so um, before we move to the question and answer period, I just want to give a moment for uh, Ms. Halperin and Dr. Bickerstaff mm -hmm. to, to see if there's anything else they would like to say uh, in closing. Yes, I have a few more acknowledgments just at the high school level. Um, I do want to thank Dr. Shannon Pignato, our wonderful principal here at Auburn High, um, who, as Dr. Bubb said, supported this project um, and then was just so great for working with the um, virtual a setting for this project. Um, Mr. Russell Johnson was our tech guru at the high school and he was often in class as I was trying to run around with the computer making sure we could um, interact with Dr. Bubb and the college students. So we're really appreciative of him. Um, Mr. Drew Morgan, whose uh, work on this project two years ago got me involved with it. Um, and so his passion for the project, genealogical research in Baptist Hill Cemetery um, encouraged me to continue on with it. Um, and Dr. Blake Busman, who is another teacher here at Auburn High School, who um, listened through some of my earlier questions about running um, a project like this in my AP classes, um, and it was just a great listening year. So thank you to all of them. And as a descendant of the families of Auburn, I have to send a huge and warm thank you to all of those descendants that were willing to open their homes prior to COVID, receive phone calls, emails, provide information. This is the West African concept of Sankofa at its best. Mm -hmm. Sankofa is, is a bird flying, flying forward while looking backwards. And so what we're doing is flying forward while we're looking backwards, remembering, uh, reflecting, but also moving forward with hope. And so that's what we've been doing. And so thank you to all of those families that are willing to allow others to help care and curate our stories while while we fly forward while looking backwards. Thank you. I was muted again. My apologies. So again, uh, so we can go ahead and open up a question and answer um, period uh, right now. Um, uh, and again, for, for any of us, uh, if you have a question, go ahead and leave it in the, the chat and then we'll get to it. I know I'm looking at the, the chat right now. There is one question in there that says, are any of these proposals going to be presented to city government or to the university in hopes they might come to um, fruition? Um, that's an excellent question. Uh, we did send invites out to the Auburn City Council, the Opelika City Council. We also um, sent invites out to Lee County um, commissioners, um, to the athletic director here at Auburn University. Um, uh, and so several announcements did go, go out to different departments also here at the university. And so I'm hoping that, you know, some of them tune in tonight or on Wednesday night and get to hear some of these, these proposals that the students have come up with. 
And again, things like the Giddens Memorial and uh, the uh, outdoor classroom outside Baptist Hill, those are those are proposals. We would love to see them move forward. Um, and I think we'd, we'd be willing to help out um, with that as well. Might I add to that question? It takes the entire community to make this happen. In order to make these types of things come to fruition, in order to remember where, we, where we've come from, it takes you. It takes you and your circle of influence in pulling those persons that are part of Auburn University, that pulling those persons that are part of the community of Auburn and the city government, and you being that voice to help us and the entire team you become a part of this team by speaking truth to power and saying these things need to be done. So that's how you you are able to help. I'm not seeing too many other questions there in, in the chat. If you have one, you're just a little too shy to type it out, go ahead and, and, and just, just do it. Just type it in there. We'll be more, more than happy to, to answer it. Um, if you have a question that you would like to email one of us, um, I'm sure if you get in contact with Maven or just look me up on the, the uh, Auburn website um, or, or any, I think any of us really, uh, we'd be able to respond to you um, as well. Okay, well, I don't see any other questions there. I just want to thank you again for tuning in and listening to the stories uh, from the, the high school students. We hope you're able to gain something uh, from that. Um, we hope you have a good evening. And if you have some time on Wednesday night and you would like to see uh, a different version of the, of the stories that were told from different groups, I think uh, that would be great um, for you to tune in. I think you, you'd learn a little bit more from a different perspective. Of course, as I'm saying that, a couple more questions come come in. So I, I guess I didn't wait long enough. They always tell you as an instructor that you know the silence is good, right? You let yeah. people to think. Awkward wait time. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that wait time. So yeah, so there's a couple more. So let, let's go ahead and answer those um, while we're still here. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, I can speak for that question from Miss um, Kelly here. Um, we are definitely planning to work on this history next semester. So my um, courses move through modern U.S. history. So we'll be moving into um, the civil rights era in the spring. So we're excited about that. Um, and then Dr. Bubba and I have plans to continue. Um, we've talked about um, story mapping, um, which you saw in the earlier video, um, more of the history of Baptist Hill. Um, we're really hoping to get to talk to more of um, the ancestors um, of some of the stories we learned about this year in the semester. Um, so having students to get to have some interaction um, with the people and the families that they researched is a goal of ours for next semester. Um, and we'd also love, um, hopefully COVID depending, to take the kids out to um, Baptist Hill Cemetery um, on a field trip, hopefully. Um, and the junior high level, we took them to the Lee County Courthouse to do some of the um, historical document investigations themselves, and they really enjoyed that. So I think those would be the goals, um, depending on how um, pandemic restrictions are in the spring. So. Yeah, and I'll add up that to also the question came in about the project being repeated, repeated in future semesters, and um, I would love to do this every semester. Um, I, you know, if the, if the, you know, the high school is willing to do it, if Ms. Halperin is willing to do it, you know, um, if the junior high is willing to do it, I would love to continue this process. I think it's been an incredible experience for, for um, the high school students, the junior high students when they did it two years ago. It's an incredible experience for the university students to engage with, um, with, with uh, other students that, that, I mean, really, I think kind of look up to the, the college students and have that interaction. And so I think there's, lots of positive things that, that come from it. And there's no shortage of stories. Um, I mean, if we were to sit here and do this every semester for the next you know, 20 years, I think we'll still come up with more stories to tell. There, there's plenty of them out there. We just think about the number of, of um, headstones and burials that are just in Baptist Hill Cemetery alone. 
that could, I mean, that could be, that could go on for a very long time. So I, I would love to see this um, continue um, every semester that we're able to do it. And as families of, that are descended from these families, we are in partnership and we're pushing that, that these things happen, whether they're happening inside of the classroom or outside in our outdoor classroom and, and as extracurricular activity um because it's important so not only are the students that are in the classroom learning there are there are families that are learning more about their ancestors so as a part of the teamwork we're pushing that every semester and even outside the semester there are opportunities for it, the team to continue to do the research and the story mm -hmm. All right, so a comment and question came in about the practical proposals of building amphitheaters, et cetera. It looks like some people are interested in, in being a part of that. The question is, will you have students help build one in the future as part of this ongoing um, project? Um, I think that's, a, that's an excellent question. So um, uh, as part of the class itself, actually physical building of something, I'm not sure you know, if we would be able to do that. But um, I know that on, on weekends, as well as some of the students in, in, the, in the research aspect of, of the course, uh, we go out and we do work um, in a, a lot of the cemeteries, African American cemeteries here in Lee County. Um, the um, Lee County Cemetery Preservation Commission also does, does work out there. And so, for the example, Giddens Cemetery, um, we're, we're moving there to, to clear that area out and have work days out there to get that space um, available so that it can be turned into a memorial if we're able to do that. And so we do have some permission from the landowner there. He would also like to see it become a memorial space. And so those are the type of partnerships that allow us to, to move some of these ideas forward. And so uh, by all means, if you want to be involved, we would love to have you be, in, be involved. There is, a, I think, a process to it. Um, one of those processes, we always want to make sure that whatever we do goes through the descendants of those that are buried in those types of cemeteries. Um, so I think about the memorial space at, at Giddens. We we want to make sure that we're we're um, listening to what the families want to happen in those spaces. And we like to say that you know we, you know we like to be at the table with the families at the head of that table. And so I think um, that that's incredibly important. Uh, same thing with like the memorial space. I mean the outdoor classroom at, at Baptist Hill. Um, you know the the city owns that particular lot that we were talking about. Um, uh, and it's marked for um, intersection improvements, possibly a green space there. And so this, the space is already kind of available if, um, if the city council sees a need um, or you know, if we can get support to turn that space into an outdoor classroom, I think it'd be a wonderful addition to, to, the, um, to the city. And so um, things like amphitheaters and outdoor classrooms and those types of spaces, um, I, I'm not an architect, um, so, so we wouldn't need help there. So I would just add to that, if you are interested in helping out, um, you can send me an email. Like I said, you can look me up uh, on, the, on the Auburn University website. Um, uh, my email address is robert.r.bub at auburn.edu. Um, you can send it there um, as well. Hi, Ellie. It's great to hear from you. I wish you were in my class this semester. Um, I know you love doing that project in the junior high, so we're really glad that you're still getting involved at Baptist Hill um, and respecting their graves um, so well for John Cobb and Paul Grant's Just so that you're not you're not too worried about it, um, LA, We uh, we did take care of the flags and everything on, on Veterans Day um, uh, this past November, and so they were they were honored and respected. Um, so that, so that did happen. Thank you again for such a wonderful evening, um, and and um, Terrence and Caitlin. I don't know if you had anything last things that you wanted to say. Just thank you so much for um, your work, Dr. Bub, and uh, thank you for the students and all the work that they put in as well. It was exciting to see it. I would love to thank 
you, Dr. Bub, and you, Mrs. Halper, and for all that you all do, all of the students. And hey, this is fun stuff. This is fun stuff. And so it is ours to continue. So let's let's continue doing. If you know somebody that it's buried out there, if you know of a family member that is connected to someone, contact us because we want to be in contact with them. We want to hear those stories or we want to introduce them to their ancestors. So, hey, now you're involved in the work with us. You're a part of the team. Join us. Thank you. Thank you, Terrence. Thank you, Caitlin. It's been great, uh, great working with both of you. Um, this is something that, you know, it's been years that we've been working together and I imagine it'll be years uh, in the future. We wish everyone a good night and uh, and take care, especially, uh, you know, be safe out there with our, our current COVID situation. Thank you.